Hey everyone, welcome back to another video. So if you don't know, my name's Jonathan. I run the GDXR YouTube channel, the Discord server and everything else. So if you want to hop by, ask any questions, make sure to check out the links below. And what we're going to do in this video is we're going to cover a topic that I posted on the Patreon of essentially three things your Unreal project should have. This was asked to be turned into a video, but what we're going to do is we're going to cover this as a save and loading tutorial while also covering the other two features included in it. So the goal with this is to show you how to set up a load system in a game instance, which isn't cluttered and isn't an absolute mess with variables to make your game easier to work with and understand, basically visualize with structs as well. So what we're going to cover is we're going to cover save and loading, a game instance, why we have that in our project, and structs as a form of storing variables. Those are the three things that every project should need. I pretty much I've started doing it with the GDXR ultimate template. And I want to show you how using all those th those three things together can improve your project and take it from looking very complex to quite easy to manage. So if you want to see early access content like this and download some project files through the Patreon, feel free to head over there. It's link literally at the bottom of the video, just there. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to jump straight into Unreal. Unreal. So I know a lot of people joining this or hopping into this video will probably be expecting a VR tutorial. We're going to use the first person template, mainly because it's quick for iteration and everything that's going to be covered here is extremely transferable to VR. The only thing that would change would be your UI widget and having a button. But I'm gonna show you how to make that easier as well. So first thing we need to do is add some data or information to our screen that we can actually visualize. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a UMG HUD, which is assigned to our screen and we can have it to use it to populate some data while also having some save buttons. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna to go to content. I'm gonna create a new folder. I'm gonna call this UMG. And in here, we're gonna create a user interface, widget blueprint, widget blueprint underscore player hood. And once this loads up on the other monitor, we're gonna drag it over. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna use a canvas panel for now, just because it makes it easier to add in. What you would wanna do is use a border. Actually, we'll do that because people will complain. So we're going to use a border. So if we drag in this, you can see we've got it as our background. And the reason we use a border is it only ref it only updates on the one thing. So we're going to have a vertical box. And this is essentially going to take all of our information and we're going to put it on the screen and populate what we want. So we'll have some text. We'll have this as a name. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause the video and then I'm going to go through and add all of this in or at least we'll fast forward it. So now that we've got some information here, we're just gonna append some text to this in a little bit. But what we can do is we can open up our first person player, so blueprints, and we're gonna add our UMG to this. But what you'll notice is we don't actually have a game instance. So this is something our project will need. We'll add the HUD first. So begin play, we'll create a widget. Controller, there we go. So we can press play and you see in the top left, it's a little bit small, but we do have our stats and information that we're gonna have on the screen. So what we're gonna do is we're not gonna set up a full like ammo system to, to count all the stats. We're just gonna create a basic version and then we'll populate some data into it. So what we need to do now is set up our game instance. So we've got our first person character and our first person game mode, but a game instance exists inside of our project settings and then inside maps and modes. So we've got a default game mode, which is fine. That's what we're using. But game instance class is set to game instance, which pretty much doesn't exist. Uh, what a game instance is, is it's a persistent file throughout your, your entire project. So if you store a variable there, you can access, for, access it from different levels, even if you change them, and it'll store that information from the variables. If we take a look at the documentation for creating and saving a load system, it is pretty old now, but what they do is they show how to do this with individual variables. So 
player name, they save game instance, they drag off, and then they set the player name. You can imagine, if you've got a project with a couple of hundred variables, that is going to get quite messy. So this is where the structs come into place. What we can do is we can create a struct after our game instance, and we can store all our variables in there. So before we jump ahead, let's do the game instance. We're going to go blueprint class, all classes, game instance, select, and then we'll call this gi underscore save example, because that's what our project is. And we can open this up and you'll see it's just a normal event graph. But what we need to do now is in project settings, we've got to add our game instance, gi save example. So now when we press play, our player will use this game instance and be able to read variables from it. So now that we actually have our game instance, what we could do is we could open this, uh, do what I said, we could have player name. So it would be name, just do this roughly. We've got rounds fired because I changed it from ammo. So that'd be an integer and then currency would have another integer. And you can see how going through and adding each individual one of these can make this variables list extremely long and really difficult to manage. So we're gonna change these out for a struct. So we're gonna delete these variables. We're gonna to go to our content graph. We're gonna right click and go to, if I can remember where they are, struct. So we're gonna do S underscore. And essentially this, you can group them together as different. So different blueprints can have different structs and variable lists essentially. So what we'll do is we'll call this S underscore player settings or player info. It's probably more accurate. And then if we open this up, you can see here, we've got the option to add variable and new members. So we can add a variable for each one. So we've got a name. So this would be player name. And then we'll set this to name. We've then got um, shots fired be integer currency we'll do integer as well because we don't need to go the accurate and what was the other one health vote and we'll do health and to keep this easy we'll just do a float if I select it cool so what we've got here is we've got a list of our default player settings now we're going to use this struct inside of our game instance and then we're going to go from there so you might be wondering how we can set these. If you go to the top left, you've got default values. So you can see here, we can set our player's default information. So player name, we're gonna have it start with Jonathan. Shots fired is gonna be zero. And then currency, that is set to a bool, so we need to change that. Currency is gonna be an integer. Default value, so currency zero, health. Uh, that would be, let's say 100. Actually, name would be none because we haven't added one that's what we're going to do so the only one here really is health is going to have a default value of 100 because that's what's going to happen when we start the game so when you're using a struct it might be quite tempting to just go straight to your player and then add the struct in here like a variable so if we do this i'm going to struct uh this would be player info and then we can get the struct player info. We could drag that in, get, and then break. So you can see how here we can access the struct information inside of our blueprints. But the problem is now we would have to send all of these variables back out to our game instance to then pull them back in. So what we can do is inside of our game instance, we could go to variables. We can search for our player info. Add that as a struct. So rename so player info. And now we've got access to this in here. So what happens here is the game instance is reading this struct. So it's technically the game instance is listening to the struct and then it can be used elsewhere. This will make more sense in a minute. So now that we have our game instance set up, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at changing some of those values in the struct from different blueprints. What it might be tempted to do is bring in the struct variable from the actual variables list. So player info, and then you can drag this in, get, and then you can break the information from here. But what I wanna do is I'm gonna show you 
why we're not going to do it this way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to brute force this and just do an event tick. And then we are going to print string. And we're going to print string the player's name. I'm going to do compile. So now if we press play, we see it says none down the left hand side. But what we're going to do now is going to create a blueprint class and we're going to set that name from here. So bp underscore set player name. And in here, we're going to have a collision box. And then we're going to actually use this to set some information. So what it might be tempted to do is actually select the box and then just set the information. So on component begin overlap, we get our struct. So info or player info. And then we set this. So we drag this out. Uh, we get, we do break, actually we do set. So set members and then we tick player name. So we say on overlap, we set our player name to, let's say Jonathan. And we'll do a print string at the end and we'll say set name. And we'll pop this into our level. Let's put somewhere we'll see. Oh, we'll know we're actually crossing. So we cross between these two pillars. We should see our name change to Jonathan. So we grab our gun, we walk through, and you'll see that nothing happens. We're technically setting the name, and we saw the hitch where it actually fires the print string, but it's not setting the information in the struct. It's just not keeping it there. So this is why we have to do it a little bit differently. So we're gonna do that, we're gonna delete this bit here. We'll keep this, because we'll use it in a minute. And then instead of our player, we're gonna remove this section here as well. So to make this work, what you're gonna to have to do is we're gonna to have to cast to the game instance and pull in that struct. So before our create widget, we're gonna do right click, get game instance. We're gonna to cast to uh, GI and then save example. I'm going to plug this in the top here and because we're only casting once on begin play and we're casting to something that always exists we don't have to worry about using the cast node it's absolutely fine then we're going to right click on as gi save example we're going to promote this to a variable so this says when we start we have a variable or a reference to our game instance so we don't have to cast anymore inside of this blueprint we can then plug that into create widget player hood and now what we can do is inside of our game instance, after we compile and save, we can access this player info struct that we've added here. So this is still a reference to our original struct. We're just gonna use this to set information in it. So if we go to our player and we go down and grab our asgi save example, we can get this, we can get our struct. So get player info and we can drag off this and we could do a break. And if we do the event tick thing again, so event tick, we'll do a print string to player name. And then inside of our BP set player name, we can do the exact same thing. So we're gonna copy that first cast section. So cast to the game instance. So event begin play. We cast to our game instance and we promote this to a variable. And then from there we can get the reference and we can set or get our player info. And then if we drag off this pin, we've got a set members. We can do that and take our player name so it appears. And we can overlap that there. So now we do player, actually we do Jonathan. We can hit compile. So what we're doing here is we've got our Game instance is essentially at the top of our like pyramid. We're storing our struct here and it's kind of accessible. Then our player is getting a reference to that struct from our game instance and so is the other blueprint. So rather than having the player talk to the blueprint or the blueprint talk to the player, they're both just talking to the game instance and the, everything else pulls from there. So now if we press play, it still says none. But as soon as we walk over, you see it's now changed to Jonathan. So from there, we can start saving that data.
So before we set all the rest of it up, for example, what we could do is we could go to our game instance, and this is where we could actually pull this information and save this struct. So you'd have that in here, get player info. So really the, the game instance is driving our data. So in our first person character, we currently have it on event tick, we're getting and setting our string so we find out who our player is. But what we could do is we could do the exact same thing for our widget. So we can copy this cast stuff because we just need to know where it exists. And if we go to player HUD, we can go to graph and I need to make sure our player name is a variable. And then if I paste this in, so on construct, so one hour UMG is added to the screen. We cast to our game instance and we get that reference again. And then we can use this to set our name or append to it. So we can get our name, get, and then we could do set text at the bottom. do nothing let me figure that out you know what rather than being lazy i'm going to just delete that and that and then inside of the designer i'm just going to add another text box um so text box don't know if it's going to let me put it next to it wrap with horizontal box text box name to display and then is variable so name to display get set text which it set text and then we can plug that into there like so and now if we get our as gi save example get we can then do Player, get player info, break, plug that in like so. So hopefully now that will work. So I'm an idiot and I realized that in player info, we don't actually have a name set. So if I set this to Jonathan, or actually we'll do this as none. So when we press play, pick up a gun, you see in the top left it now says none, and nothing happens when we walk over a box. So what's happening is our game instance is going to our player, uh, player hood, and then we're pulling in that information and setting it to our widget. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go to our BP set player name blueprint. Um, don't know if we already had this set up. So what I've done, because I had to do some debugging, is we're gonna take our game instance variable, we're gonna drag that in and we'll do get, and then what we can do is we can get our player info and do a set. So set members and instruct and then player name, make this visible. And we can plug that into our voting box. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make this a public variable. So promote to variable for player name. And then we can have player name, which I've already got. So let's delete that one because I, was debugging so let's plug that one in there just so we don't duplicate blueprints so now what's happening is when we overlap our box we're going to take the information from this variable and we're going to put it through to our set members inside of our game instance and then our hood is going to pull that down or is it so that's the thing to keep in mind so when we press play what should happen now is this variable is currently set to none so it will say none so if we walk through it nothing's going to happen because we're setting the text to the same text we already have. So in the blueprint, what we want to do is select our blueprint that's in the level, play a name, we're going to set this to Jonathan. And then we can test this. But this is what I want to point out. If you're new to this, you'll notice that when we overlap it, it might not set our name. So we cross it and it still says none. The reason for that is our UMG our event construct is done on start. So as soon as our UMJ is attached to our screen, we're pulling in this information. And even though we're changing it, this UMG is not being told to update. 
So if you've never used event dispatchers, this might blow your mind, but I do have a video on it to show you down below how you can use those. And we're gonna do that with the game instance. So inside of our game instance, we're gonna create an event dispatcher. And I'm gonna call this player info updated or player info update. Let's do the updated. And then I'm gonna create a custom event. So this custom event is player info has updated. And all we're gonna do is we're gonna call that event dispatcher. So we drag this in, we say call. And now what we can do is we can tell other blueprints to send this information and when to fire it. So we're gonna start with our blueprint. What we're gonna do is we're gonna to go to BP underscore set player name. In here, after we've set our members, we're gonna get a reference to our game instance again. And we're gonna call the player info has updated custom event. So this is now setting our information inside of our game instance, our struct located inside the game instance. We're then telling the game instance to fire the event dispatcher. They're saying that player the player info updated. And now in our widget blueprint, we can access that to tell the widget that it's something's happened. So from our game instance, we can drag up and do bind event to player info or player info updated. And we do custom event information as updated. And we can plug that into our set text. So now when we overlap our blueprint actor, it's going to tell our game instance that our text or our settings has been updated. And now any blueprint using the bind for the actual game instance will fire that event and it'll update. So we just got an error as soon as I pressed stop. Information has been updated under term old signature. Can I refresh that? Will that work? No. Ah, I didn't do compile in my game instance. There we go. So make sure you compile your game instance before adding the dispatcher to the other one. So now when we go to our blueprint and we cross over it, it now updates our name. So hopefully this is making sense. So if we keep breaking it down as we go through it. We've got a struct that contains our player information. Anything for our game, you can have as many as you want. And that exists inside of our game instance. From there, our first person player and our blueprint are talking to that game instance and they're telling us to do two different things. The player is listening to it at this point. We're not setting any information from our player to the game instance or the struct but our blueprint or set player name is sending that information and it's done through the set members node. So that goes through. And then what that allows us to do is we could take this box, we could hold alt and duplicate it. So now we've got two different areas to set numbers. And we'd have this one as in visit the discord if you have questions. So now, if we go over the first box, as soon as we overlap it, we tell the game instance we've updated our player information to the new name, and then our first person player is listening to that, or our UMG specifically is listening to it. Our player doesn't need to know about this, and then it does it that way. So now we can actually go over both of these, and you can see it sets it for each one. So this essentially so far has covered our creating a struct, game instance, setting information and pulling information and communicating that between technically four different blueprints. We've got our BP set player name, we've got our first person character, we have our widget player hood and we have our game instance. They're all talking to each other, super simple and then updating information based on what you're doing with it. So now let's say we want to save that information. What if we want our game instance to save our player info and then populate that as we go through our project. So to set up our save game, what we need to do is we need to create a save game file. So if we right click, we can go to blueprint class and in all classes, we can search save game and you can see we've got a save game class here. So this class acts as a base class for save game object that can be used to save state about the game. Essentially what it says, we can put stuff in here and it's gonna save it. So we're gonna select that and we'll do save. 
or select. So we do uh, save game player info. Oh, cancel. No. Rename player info. Let me double check we're recording. Yep. Player info save. And with that, we can actually open this up. And what we want to do is we want to set that struct in here. So we're going to say get our struct. This is the information we're going to save. So player info. And then from type, we're going to do player info. So struct player info. This is all we need to do here. We don't have to do any blueprints or coding inside of this player info save. We're going to do it all in our game instance. So GI underscore save example. What we're going to do is we're going to create a custom event. Then we're going to call this save game. And then we're going to do save or create save game, create save game object. And we're going to select our player info save. So you can have everything all in one place, or you could switch this out if you want different save files. We won't be covering that. It gets a bit more complicated, but this will get you to where you need to go. And now this is where we're getting to the kind of unreal documentation where it's like set individual variables. But what we can do, so instead of doing that, where they've got this here, we can create our instance, which we will do, and then we can actually set our struct instead. So we're going to right click, promote a variable, and we're going to say, call this save game class. And then if we drag off this, it's going to be a set player info. So set player info. We can plug this in, and we can drag in our player info to there and now that we've set our info we can use the async to save to slot so async save game to slot schedule an async save to a specific slot and then it'll go through and check for us so do that for slot name we're just going to name this manually to player info and then we'll leave that to zero you could put these inside of the actual class, I believe, and then do that. And for our save game object, we want that plugged into save game class. So now we say when our custom event fires, which we'll do in a minute, we can create save game object from our player info save. We're going to get a reference to it. And then inside of that save game object has a reference to our struct. We're going to set the information in there. So we're going to say get that struct and update its information. From there, we're going to actually do the save game to slot. So what this will do when it fires is it will create a new folder on your machine for you or in your projects folder, and it'll contain your save game, which we can then read as long as we know the player slot name. And from this, we could create a reference to the save game, but we don't need to do that. But we will do a completed and we'll do a print string just so we know we've actually finished. So save complete. And now once we've done that, we can actually fire this and we'll save our information, but we need a way of loading it. So we're going to do another custom event. So load game. We then do a load game from slot. So async load game from slot. And I'm going to manually put in the slot name because we just pasted that in manually. So we're going to pop that in there. And from that, we can do from save game, we can cast to our player info save. So now we can reference the information from this one that we've saved and then pull it back through. So we could get player info and then break this. If I spell it correctly and access the information from it, but we're going to do it a little bit different. What we want to do is we want to drag off and do get player info. We want the whole struct, but we want to then set our player info from our game instance. So we set and we plug that in like so. So what's happening here is when we load or fire this custom event, when we say on the menu load, we get the async load from slot player info name. We cast to that player info and then we pull in the information and we populate our struct with the updated information that we've got. So now we need a way of actually telling our game instance that we want to save our game. So save game. And that we actually want to load 
game. What is with my spelling today? Load game. So now we need a menu or a way of accessing a button so we can fire an event. But what we need is an actual button press. So rather than going into the input mapping and enhanced input system, I'm just going to disable jump and I'm going to use the input actions from this. So I'll say once we start, once we trigger it, we're going to create a new menu. So create widget. And this is going to be our load screen. So we're going to add, that'd be a menu actually, add to viewport. Get player controller. Uh, we now need to make a widget. So it did come up with an error, but we'll sort that out. So right click user interface, widget blueprint, user widget blueprint, underscore player menu. Open this up. We're going to do a, we'll do a border. Keep it the same. So border transparency. Actually, let's do a little bit of a tint and then vertical box that full length. And then we'll do a button. Do it in the middle. And this is going to be our save. So to do rename, save, duplicate, rename load doesn't have to be complex for this text save game load we need a text as well do text load game and then just for readability we'll add a spacer in between both of those. We'll open it up a little bit. Cool. Oh, so first person character is getting errors because we haven't set our UMG, which we've just created. So player HUD, and it's not showing because I'm putting them on top of each other because <laughs> I need player menu. Okay, so we go up to this, we can grab it, we can set our name based on whereabouts we walk, press space, and then we got our menu. We now need to do some stuff in here. So set, uh, set a UI, set input mode UI only. And then to the widget, and then we're gonna get player controller and we'll plug that into there. So now we should be able to actually press space and then it starts working, but we can see it's moving on there. So let's, Set game paused. Stop our movement. And then I believe we should be able to access this menu anyway. And then what we can do is go and get player controller, enable mouse. So um, I think it's show mouse, it's one of them. Set show mouse cursor to true. Compile, plus play, and then we can actually access both of those. And now we need to remove it. So, so just for ease of use, we're going to remove that set game pause because I can't be bothered to sort all that out. We're going to add a flip flop. A into there. So first time I press it, we open it, and then we're going to remove widget. Move from parent and set game mode, set game, set input mode game only to our player controller. And then we'll also set our mouse to be hidden again. So when, we, when we're not showing the menu, we don't need to see our mouse. So start, show mouse, we can access that. And then it's not doing it because we're consuming. <laughs> the set input game mode only so we want to do um 
let's do set input game mode and UI just for this example to save on some time. Widget class there, player controller there, high cursor during capture, and then what we'll do is we'll still be able to access to the environment and play around, but we can now remove and add all that in. Cool. So now that we've got our hood on there, we can actually talk to our player or our game instance and we can get us to update. So inside of our player menu, we've got our graph and we can delete these and we've got two buttons. So we do unclicked for load and save unclicked and we'll do event construct and we're going to cast to our gi underscore save example, do game instance. So get game instance when we create our UI and then we're going to promote that to a variable. And because of the way we've got this now, once we press our button, we can get a reference to our game instance and we can save game. And then we can do the same thing for load, even though I've just realized I put them in the wrong place. So load or save and then load. What's the time? Okay, 10 minutes. Save load. So now what we can do is we can go to a game instance. We've got save complete. And then we've got a print string for load complete. Compile, press play. So now we can run around, we can go through our objects and press space, hit save, it says save complete. And then if we load, it says load complete. So what we wanna do is ideally we wanna pass through this first one, set our name to Jonathan, and then we're gonna press space, save our game. So it should say and save Jonathan. And then once we go back, we cross over to our other collision it says visit the discord. What we can do is now we can do load and it says load complete, but nothing is updated in our UI. That is because we still haven't called that event dispatcher that we created, if you remember. So player info, it's not actually firing. So on complete, what we want to do is we want to say player info has updated. Do compile. And then we can try that out now. So text block crossover player name Jonathan. And then if we save this, so save complete, we cross over to visit Discord and then we do load, it says load complete. And then once we drop back to the game, it resets that variable back to Jonathan. So that is our save system all up and running. So I know I went over quite a bit. I didn't want to skip anything just in case it made it worse. You guys will be wondering what's going on. So to do a full breakdown, what we've got is we start with a struct. So first person player blueprints. We have a struct which contains all of our variables that our actors and our player are going to want to access. And then what we do is we attach that to our game instance. So our game instance exists in here and we've got a variable player info, which is our type struct. From this, what it allows us to do is it has our character and any other actor on begin play, cast to our game instance and then access the struct from there. So in this case, our player doesn't actually use it. We're not pulling any information into our player. We could do, but we're not. Whereas our actual, uh, where is it? Player HUD is doing that. So on construct, our player HUD is added to, the, added to the screen. It casts our game instance, and then we're getting a reference to our game instance so we can pull in that struct information. And we're using that to set our text in our UI. So really what's happening is we've, our game instance and our player and character is separate to our save system. They don't really need to know each other exists. They're all just kind of listening out to the game instance and waiting for the game instance to say, okay, we've changed our data. You guys need to update this now. So once we overlap our player box, we do the same thing. We overlap our box. 
we get our game instance, which has happened on begin play. And then we set our members inside of our struct from our game instance to choose a new name. Once we do that, it's stored in our game instance, but it isn't updated. And that is what this player info calls. So this calls a custom event, which is, is, exists inside of our game instance. And that goes through our player info updated and calls our event dispatcher. So once this dispatcher is called, our HUDs, or specifically our player menu HUD, uh, player HUD, listens to it. So this is our event dispatcher. I think I'm making this more confusing than it needs to be, but it's a lot of things all working together to do the same thing at the end of the day. It's just how you set them up. Um, from there, we have another menu, which is activated when we press our spacebar. So on a spacebar, we create a new menu and we add it to the viewport where we set the input game mode to UI so we can actually click on our interface and then we show the mouse cursor. And if we press it again, we remove it and we set it to game only and we hide the, the widget. So once that player menu is on the screen, we can select our on click load or on click save. And that again casts to the game instance and tells our game instance we want to save our game or we want to load it. And then what we're doing here is once we load it, we're casting to our save uh, game class, which we're creating. And then we're just setting our player info struct through this. So it kind of saves in there and then it gets added to our game instance. And then on complete, we say load completed. And then we activate our player info has updated event dispatcher. So any blueprint listening to this game instance will update its information and know that's changed. So if we do that again, press play. What we can do is we can cross over to visit the Discord, hit space, and then save game. And then if we back out, we cross over it again. We can kind of walk around, do what we want to do. And then when we cut through it, it saves our name to Jonathan. And then I press space, we can go to load. It doesn't update right now, but as soon as I close the menu, it should have updated. Let's do that again. Save game. Change our name to Jonathan. Load. There we go. And then it actually works that way. So it loads it in and out. So yeah, that was pretty much a long, quite a long video to be fair. But we delete that. But what I hope this has done is showed you how you can use game instance structs in a save system to keep your project really neat, but also have that communication between actors work really well and then use those all working together where they don't actually have to talk to each other directly. Um, it will make your life a lot easier once you get, a, get your head around it and it'll allow you to move your projects and build them up to something a lot cooler um, without having to worry about your game instance being flooded with information and having it go from there. So I'm going to stop rambling. If you want access to this project file to take a deep dive into it, I'll comment it all out and I'll I'll number everything, I'll sort it all out. It will be available on the Patreon, and then you'll be able to download that to take a deep dive if you want to. But if not, if you've got any questions, make sure you head over to the Discord. We're in there most days, and we're happy to help out where it is. Um, for a VR version, if you're still waiting for that, basically all you have to do is this exact same setup inside of your VR menu. It's literally that easy. Just cast your save game example, and then you can pull those in and do whatever you want because everything goes through the game instance. So just to make your life easier, I really hope that helped. I've been Jonathan, and I will see you all next time. Bye.